Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Harris with the CFP Board Center for Financial Planning. Welcome to today's webinar, CFP Certification, Why Now? Our webinar will begin in just a few seconds. Thank you for joining. Good afternoon again. My name is Dawn Harris. I'm the Director for Diversity and Inclusion for the Center for Financial Planning. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Kim Hayes, CFP, who serves as Director for Corporate Relations for the CFP Board. Um, she will be addressing some critical topics regarding why you should pursue your certification now. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dawn. I'm so glad to be able to speak to this audience. Um, and thank you for everybody spending the time here. So today we want to give your CFP certification pathway real meaning. We want to motivate you to cross this finish line. So as Dawn said, we're going to share some important resources that will absolutely help you in this process. But first, I want to talk to you about why certification is important, hopefully reminding you why you started down this process, this pathway to begin with. So in my role at CFP Board, I have the privilege of working with many firms who represent so many different business channels. One resonating theme across all of these channels is the move towards more holistic advice offering. So firms are channeling their energy, their resources towards financial planning. There are several catalysts for this change that I want you to be mindful of. So first, consumers are demanding more than investment advice. This has been driven in large part um, due to widespread access to investment insurance products. Think back before the internet, there were many retail discount trading houses that allowed consumers different trading platforms, but the internet broadened that opportunity drastically. Anyone who can turn on a computer or use a smartphone can bank online, you can buy some types of insurance online, and you can even create investment portfolios. So there was a time not that long ago that the value financial professionals brought to the client relationship was really just access to financial products. But as all of you in this audience well know, that value add is no more. Consumers want more than investment choice and portfolio creation from their advisors, and they're less interested in paying strictly for those services. And that pushes the fees down, right? Making those fees that our industry can charge for those types of services go lower and lower. People simply want more than investment advice. And although I know we're tired of talking about it, the pandemic really helped change people's thinking about their money. Many of us were faced with financial decisions that we hadn't made before. The pandemic really forced consumers to be mindful of their finances beyond just the investment and portfolio choices they had made previously. So in addition to that, we also know that industry regulation is always a catalyst for change. We can point to Reg BI as the most recent version of rules requiring substantiation of recommendations, right? We need to be able to tell our clients why we're, why we're giving this advice. But Reg BI is really in addition to that Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 that we all learned about right through our licensing. I know it's a bit of a throwback, but that act in 1934 was designed to increase accuracy and transparency in securities transactions. So that should sound familiar. Um, it created the SEC and it granted the authority uh, to monitor and regulate the conduct of financial professionals. So Reg BI really was just an update. It updated the language from that act to require broker dealers and their affiliated people. So those of you who are registered reps with broker dealers, that's you. Um, it's, it's requirement was to make recommendations in the best interest of the client. When the final rule of Reg BI was issued, many firms began to really take a serious look at their planning offering. They were giving real consideration to how this process could help advisors substantiate regulations their recommendations through regulation, right? In the wake of these catalysts of change, we're seeing firms not just market their financial planning services, but they're also making investments in technology to increase efficiency and collaboration with clients. Everybody's seen this. More and more firms are adding financial planning to their advisory brochures, which is giving advisors the ability to charge for financial planning services outside of AUM fees or commissions, right? Additionally, we are seeing firms provide their advisors with the ability to provide ongoing financial planning services, sometimes with ongoing fees, right? Monthly fees or quarterly fees. So many times these types of ongoing planning services are breaking the planning activity into smaller, more digestible conversations. And we're really, the firms are really starting to see more traction in client implementation. So from my purview at CFP board, it's really a time to plan. Firms are taking their financial planning offerings seriously and they're encouraging and expecting financial professionals like you to do the same. 
So where do financial professionals who are women fit into this? There are three important data points that should make you really excited about being a woman in our profession. So first you can see here, Americans are seeing fewer marriages among millennials. And at a glance, this may not seem overly relevant, but if you consider the differences in how financial decisions are made in married couples versus unmarried couples, I think you're gonna understand. So the Pew research that I reference here and that's available online from 2020 showed that unmarried females will be more independent in choosing where they get their financial advice, even if they're part of a couple. So that paired with these other data points is really important. Next, we see this wealth transfer, right? There's an enormous amount of money that's going to move from our baby boomer women, from the baby boomer men, or from jointly owned assets to the baby boomer women, right? This is really due to longevity as the women are outliving the male baby boomers. So, and as you can see from this third point on the slide here, um, those women are now faced with making financial decisions without their family members, without their husbands, without their partners, they're changing advisors. This 2020 Merrill Lynch study, we're gonna look at a little bit closer here, showed that 70% of women change advisors within one year of their partner dying. So now why are these data points important to you as a woman in our profession? Well, truly it's because gender makes a difference. So citing that same Merrill Lynch study from 2020, female consumers of financial services feel considerably more comfortable with their financial decisions when they're working with a female advisor. So if you look at the first cluster of percentages here on the left-hand side, you'll see the survey results of female investors working with a female advisor. So to translate for you, female investors working with these female advisors were more likely to rate that they were very knowledgeable about financial products. They were very comfortable discussing financial topics and they were much more comfortable making financial decisions compared to female clients of male advisors or frankly of any of the other gender combinations studied here as you can see from the different percentage clusters. This information is important to you because as I said before, we're seeing more consumers wanting holistic advice generated through financial planning. More of these consumers will be women Many of these women will be looking for a new financial advisor, right? And as this Merrill study shows us, women investors are feeling more comfortable and confident when working with a female advisor. So it's a lot to consider here, but the final piece of this is the CFP certification. Earning your CFP certification can be one of the defining achievements of your career. As we've discussed, demand for planning and holistic advice is increasing. But trying to set yourself apart simply by providing financial planning services is not even a real differentiator anymore. Everybody is doing it. Um, you cannot go out to an advisor's website, to a firm's website without seeing financial planning. We do wealth management. We give advice. We do holistic planning. All of those things, right? It's all table stakes now. But what will make you different in the financial advice ecosystem is first and foremost being good at it. And that's where CFP certification comes into play. Advisors who become CFP professionals point to three specific benefits of becoming certified. Competence, confidence, and credibility. In a 2021 study that CFP Board commissioned, we found that women who have become CFP professionals report they have enhanced knowledge of personal finance, they have increased confidence and skills in their ability as a financial advisor, and they have greater credibility with prospects and clients because of a widely recognized credential. And I'm just gonna take a second here and, and uh, give a little story about my own experience as a CFP, becoming a CFP professional. I had actually been an advisor for several years and, and there was that professional peer pressure inside of our office to um, go ahead, become a CFP professional, please do this. And I'll tell you what, the second that I was actually able to put those letters behind my name, um, I felt more at ease with my colleagues in the office. I felt like I was one of the team. Um, and not only that, I started getting more referrals, not just from my existing client book, but as people were establishing um, relationships, they knew they wanted to refer to me. So these were other advisors even referring to me. So it really gave me an edge. Um, and I think it would do the same for you. And that's what we're seeing here in this 2021 study uh, that, we, that we commissioned. So the competence, confidence, and credibility really come from the rigorous certification process, as well as those ongoing expectations of CFP professionals. So hopefully you're understanding my main points here, that our industry is moving towards planning. We anticipate there to be more demand for women who are financial planners. And of course, the CFP certification is truly the differentiator in shaping excellent financial planning professionals. 
So you'll hear me repeat this, and I'm doing that because it's important, and I want you to remember these data points. But there's a little more information I'd like you to be aware of before we discuss your resources, and that's some important demographic information about CFP professionals. So as you can see from this slide, there are currently just under 93,000 CFP professionals. As of year-end 2021, there were about 300,000 folks we consider duly registered. So these are people who are registered as registered reps, with a broker dealer and as an investment advisor representative with an RIA. So 300,000 of those people. The breakdown of advisors is about the same as certificates, 75% men, 25% women. And this is according to a system, a data aggregation system we use called Discovery Data. So I'm gonna reiterate some of the previous information I shared with you while you look at these numbers. Again, I know I've told you this, but it's important. And just review how these numbers come into play here. Again, more consumers of financial services are expected to be women as those baby boomer women outlive their male counterparts. Many of these women will be looking for new financial advisors. And if you remember from the slide I showed you about the 2020 Merrill Lynch study, women investors feel more comfortable and confident when they're working with a female advisor. And the umbrella, of course, all, over all of this is more consumers want holistic advice generated through financial planning. And we know to execute well in that higher value proposition of financial planning, you should become a CFP professional. So there's so much good news here. As women in the financial services profession, you're in the right place at exactly the right time. So now let's get across this finish line. As I stated earlier, earning the CFP certification can be one of the defining achievements of your career. And you're nearly there. Before I move on to the next slide, I want you to remember why you started down this path. Was it a requirement for career advancement? Or were you just at that point in your career you knew you wanted to get more knowledge to help you do your job? Was there some sort of professional peer pressure like, like I talked about earlier to become a CFP professional? Just think back, you know, why did you start this? But no matter why you started it, you've run a good portion of this race and now you need to channel your energy into why you should finish. So here's an idea for you. Women financial pro professionals are amazing mentors, always happy to take someone, man or woman, under their wing and really show them the way to be a really good example. So this is your chance to do just that. Be the example to your peers, be the example to your younger colleagues, be an example to your partners or to your children, right? You really need to establish why you're doing this. You just saw the numbers behind men and, and women, women CFP professionals. So from a capacity and ability standpoint, there's no doubt. We all know women can become CFP professionals, but let's prove that by increasing the number of women CFP professionals. It's time to really dig deep here and find your new why for finishing this. It's time to do it and you're nearly there. So you were invited to this webinar today because you've already completed one of the most time consuming parts of the certification process, the education requirement. So congratulations on that achievement, that's wonderful. Because you've already come this far, I'm certain you know what the next steps are. In fact, some of you may have already taken the CFP board exam before. If it's not your first time taking the exam and you're feeling tentative about trying it again, I want you to have faith in yourself. You can do this. You'll need to develop an effective framework for preparing for the exam again, though, shifting your strategy to focus on your past experience, right? What did you learn? If you've taken the CFP board exam before, think about how you prepared last time. What study resources did you use? What time of day did you study? Was that really the best time for you to learn and retain information? Did you feel like you devoted enough time to studying? So taking the exam previously gives you insight. You know what to expect going into this experience. So consider your other exam or practice run. Shift your strategy. Give yourself credit for the things you know now that you didn't when you tested previously. You have advantages going into this exam that you did not have before. So just be very mindful of that. But whether you've taken the test before or not, the next step in the process um, is a difficult one, but obviously not impossible. Also, you absolutely must keep in mind that the discomfort, right, in preparing for the exam is only temporary. Adequate preparation will ensure that. So with that, let's look at some of the ideas and resources that we feel like you should take advantage of. Registration for the November 2022 exam is now open and there is time for you to prepare for it. So let's talk about the resources you need to know about to increase your confidence. You need to fully understand your employer's policies related to both the time and the money commitment here. First, what time is allowed to study? What time is allowed for you to take a review course? What time is allowed for the exam, right? Just understand how your employer feels about these things. 
you'll want to know how your employer handles efforts related to certification. Also, what are their reimbursement policies? You may already know some of this since you've completed the experience, or excuse me, the education portion of the requirements, but you should check to see if your employer will pay for a review course. Will they pay for the CFP board exam costs or for your, your certification costs once you pass the exam, right? It's, it's just really time to wrap your arms around what the expectations are there. But if your employer is able to see how important becoming a CFP professional is to you, they will be more likely to support your efforts, right? Whether it is a financial or moral support. So you should also find out if your firm has any special pricing discounts through companies that provide review courses. If there's no reimbursement through your company available, these firm level discounts can be a great benefit to you. So I want you to look now on the right side of the screen where we discuss the registration fee and the schedule here. You can see the exam registration dates shown here as well as the fees. And I wanted to point out that discounted early bird pricing. It's extended clear through September 6th. So you definitely want to take advantage of that when you're registering for this November exam. Any time between now and September 6th, you have this discounted fee. So some other resources you need to be aware of once you've, re once you've registered for the exam are shown here too. The CFP board practice exam is available to you through the profile that you've set up on CFP.net once you've registered for the November exam. So you won't see that practice exam until you register for the November exam. Uh, CFP board mentorship is also available to you. After this presentation, we'll send the um, uh, PDF document here that will actually show you different links that you can um, access, one being the scholarships, and I'm sorry that I skipped over that, um, and access to see what scholarships there might be available to you as a candidate, but also a link to the CFP board mentorship. Uh, so you can sign up for a mentor. So this would be someone who is already a CFP professional probably at a firm different than yours, but they can help uh, kind of be your accountability partner there and, and get, guide you through that, that exam process. Of course, many of you probably know about the CFP Board Candidate Forum. That's a great place to uh, get additional mentorship by way of your peers. Uh, another thing to consider too, any accountability groups or mentorship through the firms, I think through the Candidate Forum, you can establish um, some, some peer groups there and certainly get some mentorship there. But if there are CFP professionals that you work with, that you work for, that are at your firm, I think, you know, any of us certainly would be willing to uh, provide some guidance and mentorship there. Again, I mentioned the review course preparation. I think this is really key. Um, you'll want to go ahead and look up and see first, does my firm have any relationship with any of the review course providers? Um, and if so, that's probably the route you're going to want to go. If not, you may want to contact any of your CFP professional colleagues just to see who did they use for their review course? Was that a great experience? And of course, Google is our friend here, right? Take some time to go out and just look and see what do other people have to say about these review courses. But these are key, especially if you finished your education some time ago. And it could be that it's six months ago, you finished it a year ago, something like that. The review course will not only help you to synergize all of the information that you learned throughout your education process, but it will also help you understand the, the, the test a little bit. And I know that sounds kind of interesting to say, but it's a tricky one. I mean, it is a rigorous exam and it takes a long time. We've got 170 multiple choice questions. Um, these are not always going to be straightforward. So I would urge you to really, you know, lean into these review courses, take time to get the mentorship and certainly uh, to feel very confident going into the exam. And of course, on this slide, we mentioned, um, you know, the employer, your friends and family, I consider these, these your team, right? You need to understand, they need to understand how important this is for you. They need to understand, of course, that this is temporary between now and the November exam. Um, you really need to buckle down, but that's where, you know, you establishing that plan of study, that plan of action and helping them understand what that means for them is gonna be key for them to get on your side and really be able to step up their game and help, but certainly need to enlist their efforts. So let's take a look at what your next steps will be. And again, I know some of this is a repeat, but I definitely want you to be mindful of this. Checking with your employer for special pricing on the CFP exam or the CFP exam review course. Okay, these are really key. If your employer doesn't have any relationship with review course folks, talk to your CFP colleagues at your firm. Um, 
You also need to understand the employer policies related to the review course and the exam reimbursement. Make sure that you understand that. Then and you can even do this today. Go out to our site. When you get this PDF, you can simply click on this link to register for that November 2022 exam. Once you've done that, sign up for a CFP board exam mentor. Um, and as I said, getting your, your friends and your family on your side here, making them understand this is a process that you need to do. You're very near the end and with their help, they absolutely could be part of that team that gets you across the finish line here. Once you register for that exam, as I said earlier, you can take your first practice exam, which I absolutely would recommend. Take the practice exam, see where you're at. Um, it will give you an assessment that allows you to understand where you need to be and then move forward with your studies, right? And of course, that's our, that's our last bullet point here is study, but these are things that you can, you can do all of this um, you know, today or over the next few days for sure to get you ready to go on this November exam. So with that, I will turn it back over. I, I wanna, I've got one more slide here and I'll, I'll be honest with you. I just pulled these from our CFP.net site, but these are all, you know, really um, our, our women CFPs, again, attesting to the fact that this has helped them. It's helped them be better at their jobs. It's helped them feel confident. Um, I would urge you to go out to the CFP.net site leaf through some of the different sections and just take a look at what some of these folks have to say. So thank you so much. I know we will open this up for questions, but I will turn this back over to Don. Great, thank you, Kim, so much for sharing um, what is very valuable information and in helping people take that next step, getting over the finish line to take your CFP certification. Um, we do have a question from Emily in regards to wondering if there is a major difference between the November exam this fall and the March 2023 exam. Um, Don, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, not that I know of. I mean, the biggest change that we've seen in the last few years was actually from last November. So that would have been November 2021 to the March 2022 exam when we added in the psychology of financial planning um, as one of the, the areas that we expect you to be knowledgeable about. So um, I, I, I know that, you know, there may be some differences from the tax perspective. There may be differences related to, um, you know, amounts that, that you can contribute to retirement plans. Uh, but there, there should not be any really huge differences there. Thank you, Kim. And, and maybe you can share for, for those who may not be familiar, what component was added this year, starting with the March exam? Sure. The, in this March, uh, the psychology of financial planning was added um, as one of the, like I said, one of the areas of knowledge on the exam. And you know, this is, we have at CFP board, we have an ongoing practice analysis, right? So um, we are constantly uh, looking for added skills, added expertise, added knowledge that is required for our CFP professionals to be really good at their job, right? We want folks who come out of this um, experience with the credentials to truly be experts in financial planning, okay? So in doing that, then there are surveys that go out to across the financial advice ecosystem, but specifically to CFP professionals, uh, really saying, hey, what, it is you need, what is it that you need to know to be good at your job? And that's where the addition of the psychology of financial planning came from. And so, you know, in, in that, and this is, this is information that you will get from your education provider. You can also order the psychology of financial planning. I know we've got a couple links in our CFP.net site that allow you to go out to the um, to the folks who are publishing that and order that. Uh, but this is, you know, it, it's wonderful. It really allows you to not only understand uh, your client's motivations, their decision-making process, but also yours, right? What biases do you have and how do you deal with that um, in an effective and constructive way so that you are truly deepening those client advisor relationships that you have. So it's a wonderful addition. Um, you know, again, March of 2022 was the first time we ever tested on, on any of that content. Great, right. thank you, Kim. Um, we have another question from Mackenzie. Um, she has completed, or she completed her education requirement in 2016. Um, she would like to know if any of the modules have changed or been added, and will the review course be enough for her to prepare for the exam? 
Uh, that's a great question. As I said, the the most recent change reflects the addition of psychology of financial planning. I don't know about um, you know changes that happened in 2016 or in between 2016 and 2021. Um, the 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 real thing, the real question here is, will just a review course be enough for me? So. I would definitely reach out to a review course provider. And again, talking to your CFP colleagues, just Googling, seeing what, what review courses are out there. That is a wonderful question for them. They'll be able to answer that question for you. Or you could even go back to whoever, whomever um, you did your CFP education with, uh, and they can, they can walk you through that. So I would, I would take this back. I'm not trying to, to, um, you know, pass the, the, the buck here, but I would say go back to these education providers and, and ask them that very question. They'll be able to answer it. Great, that was a great question. Um, we have another question from Esther. Um, she has foreign degrees and she liked to know where she can get help to determine if she qualifies to start the exam. So for Esther, I would recommend if you haven't done so already, set up your profile in cfp.net and that is where you are going to um, put information about these degrees that you have. So um, if it's your, your, your actual certificate that you've got or just transcripts, um, this is information that you will upload into your profile and that will be reviewed on the back side um, on the CFP site. Um, that's the first step. I've also been chatted here to say you could also email that information to education at cfpboard. Org. So again, that's an email address, education at cfpboard.org. Great. <clears throat> Next question. Um, I can actually answer this one. Um, will the video be distributed after the webinar? Yes, it will. Um, and as Kim indicated in the presentation, there will also be some links um, that will help guide you to some of the resources that she mentioned during the presentation. Um, that was from Stephanie. Um, our next question is from Alyssa. She studied for the exam in December of 2019. Um, she did not pass and took some time off to start a family. She's ready to start again, which is great. Um, congratulations and thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, her question is if you would recommend that she order all of the education materials again since there have been updates or mainly just taxes and psychology. Well, I will echo what Dawn is saying, Alyssa, and congratulations on picking this up and running with it again. Um, my recommendation is similar to what I was just telling one of our other uh, folks, is reach out to the uh, group who you did your education through. So wherever that came from, tell them you're ready to start again and have them help you understand what you might need that is different. So I would not just call and order everything. You can imagine, Foundations of financial planning, right? What you're starting out with, that's the core, that's the basis of your education. And a lot of that is not going to change. So you're right. The addition of psychology of financial planning and the tax piece, those will be different, but your education provider may have some resources for people who are in your exact shoes. So I would reach out to them first. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions um, in the Q&A or the chat. Um, okay, one did just come up. <laughs> this is from Emily. Um, she says that there's a large chance that she may move to Germany in the next couple of years. Um, she has seen firms with CFP professionals there, mostly men. Um, how can she research non-US firms that might be CFP focused or fee only focused? Does she need recertification for another country? That's a good, there's a lot there, Emily. Um, <laughs> what I would, I don't know is the real answer to your question. I do know that there are CFP professionals all over the world, okay? And I know that there are bases that will translate. So if you are a CFP professional in the United States, I'm sure there's most of those skills and experience will translate to other countries and vice versa. I don't know what the process is in Germany. Um, I'd like to get you to a resource though. I don't know if it's possible for you just to send me an email or we've probably got your email address, but um, hang on one second here. I'm getting some additional support, so that's great. Um, let's see here. If 
financial planning standards uh, board, right? So I'm going to give you a website because I think this is the direction you probably need to go. They'll be able to speak to the international CFP perspective. That'll be F P S B. So again, think financial planning standards board. So fpsb.org, go to the website and start down that path. I think that'll probably get you the information you need regarding certification. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, we have another question from Christine. She's curious to know what the pass information rate is for those who take the exam for the first time. I don't know what the pass rate is for people taking the exam the first time. I know uh, when information is shared, it's typically around the overall pass rate. Um, I am looking to my, I know we've got some, some folks here helping me out. Okay, apparently the information is on our website. So I would, um, I would definitely say if we go out to cfp.net, um, there's, there is information related to first time pass rates. And we're looking, we're looking for that right now. So hold on just a sec, just a second, Christine. I know we've got another question coming in, but we may have to circle back on this one. Um, Kim, I have a couple of other questions. Um, while someone actually did post the oh. link in the Q and A, great, um, Christine, if you can access that. If not, we can re repost it um, in the in the chat as well. Um, we do have another question from Alana. She um, is asking if you recommend certain study materials um, other than the review course and the practice exam. That's a good question. I and you know, in full transparency, this is this is really a great question for if you were to go out to our candidate profile or candidate forum. Okay. So that's one of the resources I think I mentioned during the, during the session. If you set up your profile on cfp.net, which you've probably already done, you have access to the candidate forum, put this out to your colleagues who are studying for the exam and see what they might recommend. Um, part of our accreditation requires that there's a separation between the education component and um, the exam component. So we don't, we don't handle the education piece. That's why we have affiliations with these with these education providers with our registered program. So you could certainly um, ask them who whomever you worked with on your education piece of this. Or like I said, I would go out to the candidate forum and and throw that question out to the to that group and see if they've got any suggestions for you. Great. Um, I did repost um, the link if those of you may not have um, been able to access it in, in the Q and A in the chat um, in terms of the um, pass rates for the earlier question that was posed. Great, do we have any other questions for Kim? All right, Kim, I think you have been so thorough and <laughs> addressed all of the um, questions after your presentation that hopefully this group is, is tasked and charged and ready to go to sit for the November exam. Um, I would just reiterate um, the early bird deadline of September the 6th for those of you who are interested in pursuing the exam to save um, some, some money, but also more importantly, to give you a bit of a longer runway to help prepare and, and really give yourself time um, to take advantage of all the resources that were discussed today. So you will have a successful outcome in November. Um, I will turn it over to, to Kim if she has any last comments, but definitely want to thank her again um, for her, her insight and her time today and really encourage you to, um, to get across that finish line. I will now turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Dawn. Um, I, will just, I will just echo what everyone has, what we've all said so far is, um, get in there and sign up for the sign up for the November exam that will make some resources that you haven't had available to you. It'll open those up to you. So I think you should absolutely do that. I, I did see a question come in here. So I'll go ahead and, and address that. If you pay for the November exam and end up not feeling ready, can you extend to March? Um, and I'll throw this back. I know uh, Amanda has been very helpful in helping uh, answer these questions. There is a cancellation fee, but I'm uh, I'm not sure when that happens. Okay, you can postpone. You absolutely can postpone. There is a $500 fee for postponing. 
So you just have to weigh that against the, the discount you get with the, that early bird registration. But if you are serious about doing this, I would urge you to move forward now. I understand that there's hesitancy. I understand you hear that this is a hard test. It absolutely is, but there's no reason that you can't be prepared between now and then. So please just take advantage of the resources that you have there. And I, I cannot wait for you all to be a part of the CFP um, professional community. So good luck with everything and thank you so much for your time today.